Happy Friday, everybody. This is Horizons Middle East and Africa. Our top stories this morning. Kamala Harris says a two-state solution is the only path forward and press for a ceasefire during her meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu. Asian stocks and U.S. futures are showing signs of recovery as traders mull the rotation out of tech and the likelihood of Fed rate cuts. The yen in focus with faster Tokyo inflation keeping a Bank of Japan hike in play. Plus, South Africa's economic revival needs a jump start, says the CEO of the country's largest business lobby. Our exclusive interview later this hour as part of Next Africa weekly segment. And it's just gone 8 a.m. across the Emirates. I'm Jumana Versace in Dubai. What a week it has been from a political perspective, but also for markets as well. That big rotation, one of the major themes that has come through out of those large mega cap tech stocks into some of the smaller uh, caps. And we're going to talk more about that on the show. But just a quick glance at how the Nasdaq ended yesterday, because as you can see, it was another down day for tech. Uh, tech stocks down more than 1 percent. Magnificent seven stocks down about one and a half percent. The S&P closed below 5,400. But what we can see today is some stabilization is coming through. A bit of green in the future is pointing to an, uh, an open of plus 0.4 percent. Ten-year yields also in focus today. We're sitting at 4.24 percent. Don't forget, we've got the Fed meeting coming up next week. And even though a former Fed official, Dudley, thinks that the FOMC should begin their rate-cutting cycle as of next week, there isn't a lot priced in. We're still sitting at around 66 basis points for, for the full year. And also don't forget, later today, we have that PCE print, a key uh, inflation gauge as far as the Fed are concerned. So dollar yen continues to be in focus as well. One of the major uh, trades that saw a bit of a shakeout this week. We saw uh, almost a seven point move over the course of the last 10 days with the currency pair. But let me just uh, switch on and I just want to show you a quick recap of how the earnings season has done so far. Uh, this just gives you an idea of how the different sectors within the S&P have done. So you can see the market reaction for energy stocks has been quite positive post results up about four and a half percent but down at the bottom look consumer staples down five percent on days where they've released their earnings discretionary down 2.6 percent part of that basket is autos yesterday huge down day yesterday for ford uh, the stock was uh, basically end of the day about 16 to 18 percent lower so a really shocking move its biggest down day since 2008 Switching the board again, and here I just want to highlight the massive rotation trade that has gone through as well out of those mega cap big tech stocks into the Russell 2000. And here you can see quite clearly uh, what the bar charts have signaled over the last couple of weeks. But ultimately, what we're seeing here is that this three-week outperformance of the Russell 2000 is the biggest outperformance since 2000. So a lot to digest there in terms of the rotation. But let's also check in on how markets in Asia are faring. Avril Hong is in our Singapore studio. Avril. Yeah, Jumana, Asia's stock market route this week, taking a bit of a break. A lot of this has been driven by the climb in the Japanese currency, but overnight we saw it giving up some of its gains, moving off the 152 level, and this was after faster than expected US GDP numbers. So some gains in the Nikkei after heavy selling pressure earlier in the week, even Chinese stocks are a bit firmer. And this is at the end of a week where we've seen the PBOC easing a fair bit. That that's prompted this rally you're seeing in Chinese bonds, the yield on the 10-year hitting fresh record lows. The Thai X is the outlier today as Taiwan markets reopen after a typhoon. They're playing catch down to the questions swirling around the AI narrative. Jumana. April, thank you so much. Well, back to U.S. politics. Kamala Harris says she pressed Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to accept a ceasefire and warn him about the civilian death toll in Gaza when they met in Washington. This was their first meeting since the vice president entered the 2024 race for the White House. Her comments suggest a possible departure from Biden's approach to the Gaza situation. She also called for the resolution of the conflict and getting a deal done. A two-state solution is the only path that ensures Israel remains a secure Jewish and democratic state and one that ensures Palestinians can finally realize the freedom, security and prosperity that they rightly deserve. 
for more, uh, let's bring in Bloomberg's Vani Quinn, who joins us from D.C., and our reporter in Jerusalem, Dan Williams. Uh, Vani, I just want to start with you. Uh, we know that Prime Minister met with uh, both uh, President Biden, but VP Kamala Harris as well. And uh, for many around the world, this was our first opportunity, really, to get a glimpse of how the VP is thinking about the war in Gaza. What did we learn from that meeting? Yes, and you'll notice, Shimana, that there were public remarks, right, which is quite unusual. We didn't see sort of planned public remarks from Joe Biden with this particular meeting, even though he said some of the same things to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. It's clear that Kamala Harris wants to signal an alternate approach, something maybe more strident than perhaps Biden is known for. It's also clear that she wants to reach out to those parts of the electorate that had definitely felt alienated by President Biden over the last year or so given that there was protest that the whole world saw around campuses. There was even police called in in certain circumstances to break up these protests. And there were protests on Capitol Hill today, not mm. least of all, almost 40 uh, representatives and senators that didn't attend that speech by Netanyahu. Yeah. Uh, Dan, let me put this next question to you, because I thought it was really interesting that in comments to reporters after that meeting, the VP Harris said that the two-state solution is the only path that ensures Israel remains a secure democratic state. How is that likely to go down uh, within the Knesset, which not long ago rejected any notion of a two-state solution? It certainly wouldn't go down well, neither in uh, Israel's legislature or, I imagine, among the wider Israeli public, given this Gaza war, given the Hamas attack on October 7th that triggered the war. Um, there's very little patience for the idea of a two-state solution. This is an idea that's been flagging for a decade now since the last set of talks between Israel and the Palestinians under U U.S. sponsorship broke down a decade ago. However, um, the vice president is not really stating a new position. This has been stock, uh, the stock U.S. position. In fact, international consensus going back more than three decades. And indeed, the former U.S. president, Trump himself, spoke about uh, Palestinian statehood as part of his Middle East plan launched just a few years ago. So Israel really is setting out a position that's out of sync with much of international opinion. Yeah. Dan, let me just ask you more broadly how the reception has been to the speech that the Prime Minister gave to Congress yesterday. Very polarizing speech. It was very fiery. It was almost an hour long. How did it go down back home within the Israeli public? Did it resonate well? I think there was widespread appreciation for Netanyahu's uh, showmanship, the virtuosity of the delivery of that speech. I think no one doubts that as an orator, he's very strong and he's very good at uh, setting out um, Israel's position. However, uh, in the polls, his standing is not good in Israel. Um, there is much rancor over the fact that under his watch, the October 7th attack, attack took place and Israel failed really to mount an appropriate response. This is a um, protracted war that's inflicted casualties on Israeli uh, troops and civilians on October 7th on a scale not seen uh, in decades. So I don't think it's done that much to uh, win back uh, domestic support. However, I've heard uh, grudging appreciation even among um, those who don't necessarily like the Prime Minister or don't want to see him stay in office for the fact that as a national spokesman, as someone who uh, is potentially capable of shoring up what appears to be eroding bipartisan support in the United States, he put on a very good show. Mm. Well, speaking of that bipartisan support, uh, we know that the Prime Minister, um, Mr. Netanyahu, is also making a trip to Mar-a-Lago today, Vonnie. He'll be meeting with former President Trump. And President Trump himself, at this point, is refusing to commit to any debate with the current VP, Kamala Harris. Uh, what do we know about the strategy here and whether or not there will be some form of a debate between a, a Harris when she's formally nominated as the presidential candidate and former President Trump? Well, that's the sticking point, according to the Trump campaign. You said it there, Jamana. She hasn't been formally nominated. And the way the Trump campaign put it, it was that the Democrats are in such disarray, there's such chaos there, that it would be imprudent to commit to anything before there is a formal nominee, that, you know, Harris may not even be it, which is a little ludicrous at this point, given that... 
No one is suggesting that there will be any kind of challenge to Kamala Harris as the nominee, except for the Trump campaign. However, they are entitled to do this and to say what they want to say. It is interesting, though, because it comes just a few hours after Harris spoke to reporters. She was coming back from Houston, having spoken to a lot of union workers and teachers and so on in Texas. And reporters asked her, will you debate Donald Trump? And she said, let's go. Let the electorate see this split screen. I'm fine with this. And Trump himself had brought it on himself. He had a call with reporters on Monday and he said he wanted to debate Harris. In fact, he would be quite happy debating her more than once, after which we got proposals from Fox and from NBC for two more debates added to the September 10th ABC debate that had already been agreed to by both camps, I should say. But now the whole thing is, you know, on yeah. pause until at least the DNC August uh, 17th and beyond. Mm. Well, so far, what we got this week is Harris is going out on the attack, and President Trump seems to be refining his own attack lines. <laughs> Bloomberg's Wani Quinn and Dan Williams, thank you so much uh, for your contributions. Now, still ahead, we hear from South Africa's largest business lobby about the important role of reviving state-run logistics and getting the nation's economy back on track. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Jumana Bersechi in Dubai. Wall Street equity futures showing signs of recovery as traders balance resilience in the U.S. economy with firming expectations of Fed cuts in coming months. Faster than expected second quarter GDP growth suggests demand is holding up under the weight of higher borrowing costs that might buy the Fed more time before having to start the easing cycle. Join us, joining us now to discuss is Norman Villama, the UBP Group Chief Strategist. Uh, good morning to you, Norman. Maybe let's just start with the price action um, that we've seen over the past week. Earlier on in the show, I was talking about this big rotation that has taken place out of the uh, mega cap tech stocks into the uh, smaller cap Russell 2000. In fact, it's the biggest rotation we've seen since year 2000. What do you point that down to? And is it likely that this rotation move is going to continue to have legs? Yeah, look. There's uh, the gap all right we seem to be having a little bit of technical difficulties here we will uh, look to re-establish connections uh, but of course one of the big themes that we have been talking about is that big rotation trade in the context of a a bigger pullback that we're seeing across all assets not just in equities the nasdaq for the week is down more than three and a half percent s b down more than two percent but then you think of dollar yen as well take a look at some of the price action that we've seen in some of those key currency pairs we will be talking about that ahead of that Bank of Japan meeting next week. Expectations are growing that that hike is going to come through. Uh, but today you can see uh, that the futures are stabilizing. S&P futures are leaning towards the green up half a percent uh, and the 10-year yields are still at around 4.24 percent. It seems as though our guest has come good. Norman, what do you have to say about that rotation trade that I asked you about? Yeah, look, the valuation gap between the large and tech stocks in particular and small cap had gotten very, very wide. I mean, you're starting to see earnings pick up in some of these small names, and we think that was the catalyst to close that gap. But we think now, in terms of valuations, they've gotten a fair value from here. Um, and so investors need to be a bit cautious about continuing to push that trade. Yeah. I was reading a note written by our Bloomberg colleagues about uh, the, the scale of the pullback not being unusual, but the timing and the magnitude of how quickly it's happened is slightly unusual. What do you make of the speed of the declines that we've witnessed the last couple of days? Uh, the speed has been uh, has been breathtaking, really, in terms of how rapidly money has shifted from uh, what it had been focusing on tech into the small cap trade. Um, we think that really uh, can be attributed to the concentration of positions that you have right now. Um, and overall, what we're seeing in a lot of trades uh, is this rapid rotation and the fast moving of money. Um, and so it's really a characteristic of the market as a whole, and I don't think really uh, only focused on this uh, small cap trade. 
We've got a Fed meeting coming up next week. I know uh, former New York President Dudley uh, hinted yesterday or said yesterday that he thinks the FOMC, FOMC should begin the rate cutting cycle. There is not a lot priced in for next week. How likely is it that the tone uh, of the conference uh, is, is going to affect the trajectory of where stocks are headed from here? Is there anything that could come out next week that could put some support to the sell off? Well, I think, as you pointed out, the GDP growth numbers yesterday were, were fairly strong um, and surprising the markets a bit. And so that will allow the Fed to, I think, fairly confidently uh, stay focused on the September meeting for a cut. So I don't think there's going to be any surprises coming out of next month. It will allow the market to focus on the start of a rate-cutting trajectory in the fall rather than uh, next week. I see that in your notes you still like to hold gold. Uh, it's been a tricky week for the precious metal, which is interesting because you would have thought with further interest rate cut expectations that the precious metal will be doing well. But it seems to be one of those trades that is getting uh, shed alongside all of these other widely held trades as well. Do you see st still see scope for gold outperformance this year? Uh, we do think gold uh, remains a very attractive uh, investment for uh, investors looking in the year end and into 2025 from here. Um, one of the key reasons why we think gold is sold off with everything else is uh, what we've seen with the strength in the Japanese yen. That's been funding a lot of these speculative trades uh, over the course of the last six months. When we look at the underlying fundamentals of gold and what we think will be uh, an easing policy environment going into year end, we think that'll be a tailwind allow gold to resume its rally. And just to round things up, let me just ask you about uh, the other major currency pair that everyone seems to be talking about, dollar-yen. We have seen a massive shakeout of positioning there. How do you think uh, this is, is going to bode uh, for the Bank of Japan meeting next week? Uh, there is an expectation that they will hike. Does that provide further stabilization to the yen, or is that factored into the price at this point? Well, oh, look, we think that the, there's a lot of, there has been a lot of short positioning yen. Obviously, a lot of that has closed with the rally, uh, the strength that we've seen against the dollar. Uh, but it wouldn't surprise us to see a bit more strength coming in here on the yen, especially uh, as the Bank of Japan continues to unwind uh, its easy policy. And on the opposite side, the Fed uh, starts to ease. Um, and so there's a bit more left, we think, in dollar yen here. All right, Norman, going to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Norman Villama, UBP Group Chief Strategist. Also coming up, Hermes is bucking the luxury slowdown with the higher sales, but flagging weakness in China. We've got the details next. This is Bloomberg. have different uh, recipe, 500 recipe has been made since two years for the athlete. We are there to uh, help them to uh, win a, a medal, you know. The Olympics is a net positive, you know, the, the world has its eyes on the country and uh, business-wise, I think it can only be positive. Everyone is coming to Paris for the Olympics, so of course uh, it's a unique opportunity to meet. Uh, I think uh, as CEOs and uh, sponsors of the Olympics, we are used to, to discussing. Well, excitement is clearly building for the opening ceremony of the Paris Olympics tonight. Uh, those were some of the guests speaking on Bloomberg in the lead up to the start of the Games. Now, Hermes has reported a sales jump in the second quarter, with all regions except China seeing double-digit growth. The Birkin bag maker is weathering the luxury demand slowdown better than its peers, thanks to its reliance on the wealthiest clients. So for more on this, Bloomberg's Rachel Chang joins us now from Hong Kong. Uh, interesting to see that Hermes, even Hermes, is not entirely immune to some of the headwinds coming through from China. Uh, but they have been more resilient than some of the other luxury brands. Tell us more. 
Right, that's right. I mean, Hermes is much more reliant than the other luxury houses on that ultra high-end kind of buyer, you know, the sort of buyer that has multiple Birkin bags. So in that case, they were resilient because, you know, that, that segment, right, the billionaires are fine. So that segment is not being affected by what we're seeing in the wider economy. However, it was seeing um, a lot of weakness in its more affordable items, such as this silk scarves, which does point to that picture we're seeing across the industry, which is that that aspirational kind of upper middle class consumer, they're really pulling back. Um, across the globe um, and that's impacting a lot of fashion houses and also the picture in China remains very complicated and very challenging. Yeah, so as you say, and this has been a, a constant theme, I think, that has come up from this earnings season as far as the luxury companies are concerned. China has become a bit of a laggard. On the back of that, is it likely that we will see a change in strategy from these companies? Can they change their strategies to pivot away from too much reliance on China? Right, so I think a, a rethink of what the China promise is definitely going to be happening for a lot of these luxury labels. They put in a lot of money opening new stores in China. We may some, uh, see some are pulling back to other regions, whether the Middle East, places like Hong Kong, Macau, and Singapore as well. But beyond that, we are also seeing a rethink of reliance on this kind of upper middle class segment that's very um, dependent on the waves, the economic waves. We may see some of the high end labels really pull back to that Hermes clientele, right? The ultra high net worth folks who will not be affected by the economy and maybe we're going to see less you know outlet sales less discounts in general just cultivating a, a, a bigger aura of luxury and exclusivity and that will help their earnings be more resilient yeah. through economic recessions yeah it's ironic you never would have thought that the fact that they don't offer discounts would make the brand a lot more coveted but you know i guess that's uh that's how some economic goods behave they become more precious the more expensive they are uh, one question that sort of ties back to one of the big macro themes that we've been talking about here in markets that is the weakness of the yen the japanese yen and i was reading some support uh, some reports about Chinese travelers going into Japan to take advantage of the weakness in the yen and uh, get some good luxury deals. How has that shown up in earnings? Yeah, that's been a big impact for a lot of luxury brands. You know, LVMH earlier this week, for example, saw a huge drop in uh, the region, including China. But like in Japan, they saw a 57% jump in revenue. So that's very much because the Chinese, not just the Chinese, but travelers everywhere, are going to Japan to take advantage of that weak yen and to get luxury goods at, at lower prices. So that's not a good thing for these companies in the short term because they do have smaller margins in Japan. But, you know, I think it's not something that will persist for a long, t for a long time as the yen normalizes. And also the fact that these companies do adjust what they have on inventory. I mean, I don't know if you've been to Tokyo recently, but it's not that easy to get anything anymore. Very few items left on the shelves. Uh, so, you know, that's something that's just going to normalize over time. Uh, no, I haven't been to Tokyo recently, but uh, I do want to go, if anything, not for the luxury, but for the delicious food. Rachel, thank you so much for the report. <laughs> All right, a quick look at equity futures before we head to our break. Uh, we are seeing a bit of stabilization come through after a big sell-off uh, for ma major uh, indices in Wall Street for the most part of this week. Uh, we're tracking about 2% lower for the S&P, Nasdaq down 3.5%. Today, though, there's some green on the screen, uh, so it looks as though things are beginning to turn around. We do have that PCE print to watch out for later. All right, also coming up on our show, our next guest expects the Bank of Japan to hike rates at next week's policy meeting. More analysis with Mahjabin Zaman, Head of Foreign Exchange Research at ANZ Next. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. This is Horizons Middle East and Africa. Our top stories this morning. Kamala Harris says a two-state solution is the only path forward and pressed for a ceasefire during her meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu. Asian stocks and U.S. futures are showing signs of recovery as traders mull the rotation out of tech and the likelihood of Fed rate cuts. 
The yen in focus with faster Tokyo inflation keeping a Bank of Japan hike in play. Plus, South Africa's economic revival needs a jump start, says the CEO of the country's largest business lobby. Our exclusive interview later this hour as part of Next Africa Weekly segment. Well, it's just gone 8.30 a.m. across the Emirates. I'm Jelana Versace in Dubai, getting you uh, caught up on how these markets have fared. A bit of a sell-off week, a risk-off week for many of these equities. S&P down 2% of the week, Nasdaq down 3.5%, yesterday down 1%. Uh, but what we are seeing is some stabilization come through in the S&P uh, futures this morning, pointed to an open in the green as we look ahead to that PCE print later today. Tenure yield sitting at 4.24, still around 66 basis points priced in, in terms of rate cuts by the end of the year. No one expecting them really to do anything at the meeting next week. And then dollar yen still in focus as well. We're going to talk about FX in a couple of moments. But just a quick recap of the earnings season because it is interesting to see some of the market reaction that we've had, the price action after results have come through. Energy big outperformers up 4.5% post results. But on the flip side, what we've seen as big drops in staples discretionary, those are the sectors of the markets that have underperformed, have sold off once re results came through. Uh, switching over as well, just to give you an idea of that big rotation that we've been talking about in markets, out of the big caps, out of... Uh, tech into small cap stocks. Russell 2000, the last couple of weeks, has seen its biggest outperformance since 2000. So I think that chart encapsulates it quite well. Let's also check in on how markets in Asia are faring. Avril, what are you watching out for today? Yeah, Jumana, we're seeing investors cautiously creeping back into riskier assets. Look at where the Nikkei is sitting. It's been a really challenging week, a stock market route that's been exacerbated by the rally in the Japanese currency that's eased off from the 152 level against the greenback overnight. But this is a prompting of a rethink of these leverage bets given the unwinding of the carry trade. That is something that's actually helped the Chinese yuan this week. But this is something that is also seen as unlikely to last, given how the fundamentals are not in favor of the Chinese renminbi. It's interesting to highlight, though, that today we did see a PBOC yuan fix at 713 below that level. So slightly stronger. And this suggests that the PBOC doesn't see dollar weakness as a temporary factor. It might even be expecting a dovish outlook from the Fed next week. A lot of things that play here. Next week will be a big one to watch. Jumana. April, thank you so much. All right, switching over to the region. Egypt has raised prices for a wide range of fuel products by up to 15 percent. This latest trimming of state subsidies follows a new pact with the IMF. Egypt is battling its worst economic crisis in decades and trying to recalibrate its economy after securing a global bailout of around $57 billion led by the IMF and the UAE. Joining us now is our local brain in the region, Zian Dawood, our chief emerging markets economist for Bloomberg Economics. Let's talk uh, more about their decision to raise fuel prices by 15 percent. This also follows on, I think we spoke about it, their decision to raise the, raise the price on bread yes. as well not so long ago. And yet I noted this hasn't stopped inflation from dropping the last couple of months. No, it hasn't. Um, and the reason is there are other factors at play. One of the factors is the fact that uh, basically traders in the local market were pricing goods and services at the black market rate before the devaluation in March. So when the devaluation happened, and it happened at a lower price at the black market rate, that led to uh, weaker prices than previously anticipated. That's one reason. The other reason is what our reporters reported on, is the fact that it's sort of, despite inflation being close to 30% in, in Egypt, there is almost something like a deflationary spiral, where people don't, pri don't buy goods because they're, they expect the prices to drop, mm. and that causes the price to drop. And that's happening in some sectors, like appliances and durable goods. Yeah. Um, so inflation is still rising. In, it's, it's still, sorry, it's, it, the prices are still rising, but they're not rising at 35%, they're rising mm. at 25%. And of course, if you think about it in the context of the stabilization of the currency that has come through, it, it feels as though it does actually open the door now for the Central Bank of Egypt to start thinking about cutting interest rates. Yes, so you've got the local inflation rate, which is obviously yeah. uh, dropping. It's still high, but it's, it is actually going in the right direction. But also, importantly, globally, uh, the global yields and global interest rates are set, to, are set to fall. And that should help Egypt to lower interest rates sometime later this year. Yeah. Uh, Ziad, I want to uh, turn your attention to another piece that you've written, which uh, is, is quite controversial, I would say. And it's about 
uh, you know, it's on the terminal, but essentially what you're saying is that despite their label, Saudi non-oil sectors still very much depend on oil prices. So talk us through your thesis here. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not very controversial. It's just the name is a bit misleading. <laughs> and we get asked several times about that. And people cite non-oil oil growth as a sign of diversification. And it isn't. If you look at data from the 1980 till today, you can see a clear trend. When oil prices rise, uh, when oil prices rise, non oil growth rises. So when oil prices are below $40 per barrel, you got growth below 2%. When they're above $100 per barrel, you get uh, growth, non oil growth at around 8%. In between, it's a clear trend. Mm. So that's like the empirical data in front of us. Yeah. If you think about theory, when oil prices are high, government hires more gov and public sector workers. That cancels, non uh, that's ca cancels government services in GDP calculations, and government services are non-oil activity. Yeah. When oil prices are high, government builds more. That cancels construction. Construction is a non-oil activity. Again, but these are all funded by petrodollars. Um, so, yes, uh, non-oil growth is a, is a good thing, but it's still fueled by high oil prices. Yeah, fueled for now, but ultimately, you know, the goal is to get to a position where there's less dependence on those petrodollars. Uh, but, you know, the, I think the context here is that because they're so reliant on, on petrodollars still, to your point, everyone's so fixated on what their break-even oil price is. And speaking to many people in the markets, you know, from the debt side, investors, people tell me that it doesn't really matter because anyway, Saudi's debt to GDP is starting from such a low base, it's very easy for them to place. There, there'd be no issues for Saudi Arabia to place bonds into the market. So why are we so fixated on where this break-even oil price is? It doesn't really matter. Sure. So there's not one break-even oil price, there are two at least. There's one which is the government needs to balance its books and that's related to debt and all that stuff. And that matters in the sense that people care about how much Saudi will issue and you know maybe there's demand when, high oil, when oil prices are high but maybe that demand will fade when oil prices drop. But that's one measure of diversification. The other one is the what they, people call the external break-even price of oil. Um, and that's the price that Saudi needs to fund its imports and offset remittances outflows, roughly speaking. And for me, I like this, this measure more because its direction is a better measure of diversification of the economy. And the direction is fairly clear. That price was $44 per barrel in 2018. If you look at balance of payments data from the first quarter of this year, that price has written, risen to $71 per barrel. So the direction of it tells me that Saudi is more reliant on high oil prices. So interesting. $71 is the number then or the number that you care about. <laughs> Ziad, thank you so much for coming on our show. Ziad Dawood, our Chief Emerging Markets Economist for Bloomberg Economics. Now, investors have been rushing to buy the yen on bets that interest rates are finally about to tip in Japan's favor when the Bank of Japan makes its decision next Wednesday. The currency is holding on to an advance of about 5% against the dollar since just before it began surging on July 11. But some investors are warning that the rally, rally is fragile, particularly if the Bank of Japan disappoints expectations. Let's bring in Majabi Zaman, head of foreign exchange research at ANZ. Why has the yen rallied so much? Is it Bank of Japan expectations or just unwind of carry trades? Look, I think there are multiple factors that have been driving this. I think first, I think June, June 11 and 12, we had the intervention. That was the first step, which brought, you know, dollar yen lower. And then, of course, over the last week, what we have seen is that political figures in Japan have been talking up the yen, uh, saying that, you know, the, the weak yen is not good for the economy. Um, Bank of Japan needs to take action. That's another driver. And, of course, we had the big uh, interview um, with Trump, where he specifically targeted weaker dollar. But what he did mention was the yen and the Chinese yuan specifically. So all these drivers, along with, of course, the Bank of Japan meeting that's coming up uh, in totality, have you know, resulted in the sharp moves we've seen lately. Are you expecting to see more FX volatility into the U.S. elections this year? Look, I think, you know, volatility in a U.S. election year tends to pick up from July onwards. So unsurprising, it's not surprising that we are seeing uh, volatility uh, starting to pick up uh, in equity markets. And of course, it's, it, this is all coming at a time when, you know, Federal Reserve is about to start the easing cycle as well. We think they're going to start cutting in September. Uh, surely volatility will pick up, um, you know, a lot of uh, political rhetoric tends to impact markets as it has so far. And I think that's going to continue. Mm. I just look at the price action in the last week, and it seems to me that we're seeing a shakeout across 
every single popular widely held trade, be that Nasdaq, be it Magnificent 7, AI stocks, semiconductor, gold, also dollar yen. And I wonder to what extent this theme of moving out of carry trades in FX space is going to continue the next couple of months. Is this just a, a, a repositioning or uh, a, a trimming of positioning? Or do you think it's going to be a sustained change in the way people view these currency markets? I think that's a great question. At least for the yen, we know that positioning was extremely extended. You know, going into this with your short yen positioning at you know peak levels, and I think at some point this should come closer to being normalized. A deeply undervalued yen may not get to fair value, but at least improve in valuations. We do think that a little bit of that has some room to go. Um, coming to next week, of course, as we have seen in all Bank of Japan meetings in this cycle, um, the dollar yen tends to um, Get, yen tends to get stronger ahead of Bank of Japan meeting, but then whether the Bank of Japan hikes or not, in both uh, instances, we have seen the yen start to depreciate thereafter. So we might see a little bit of that depreciation come in uh, post uh, Wednesday. Uh, let me ask you about the pound. Uh, one of the best performing G10 currencies this year. Uh, we have a Bank of England meeting happening next week. I think the market's about 50-50 for rate cuts, even though recent commentary from Hugh Pill has suggested uh, that they're not as close to cutting as uh, some investor uh, participants would like to see. Uh, what do you see happening with the pound? And can the strength actually continue? Look, I think that's a great point, and it is very interesting to see that in the whole, um, you know, carry trade on wine, uh, sterling yen has done a little bit uh, better than maybe the Aussie yen and the Kiwi yen. And maybe there's some value to that, to think that maybe, um, you know, a Bank of England would, may not hike uh, at their meeting next week. They might hold on. I mean, look, I think for us, when we look at the sterling, uh, it's not about, uh, you know, we don't think that they will hike uh, next week. We think September looks like a better time. But for us, it's really the voting pattern. Now, the voting pattern for the NPC members has been at 7 to 2, uh, for where only two members voted for a cut versus 7 hold. Um, you know, that has to shift. Now, between this meeting and the next, you, I wouldn't expect three members to shift over to, to cutting, given that we've seen rate inflation uh, holding up. We have seen services inflation holding up, and this is, you know, Bank of England's forecasting yeah. uh, for services inflation was 5.1. We're at 5.7. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me just uh, round up asking about the euro. Anyone who would have sold the euro at 107 uh, on concerns about French elections wouldn't have made money. The euro is trading close to 108.60 now. What is it, that the euro has just shrugged off all of those political concerns now, or are they still there and not adequately, adequately reflected in where the currency is trading? I think the French elections, um, I think the market seen through uh, that volatility um, that we had in, in the FX and the bond markets as well. I think going forward uh, this week, we did see uh, flash PMIs. And, you know, with the Olympics taking place, the sentiment broadly in France seems to be doing a little bit better than it is in Germany uh, in it for that instance. So I think um, euro um, has been supported at that 108 level. Hard to see it going significantly higher than that. Uh, we'll get the CPI and the GDP numbers next week. I think they will be telling for the ECB's next steps. Yeah. Majabin Zavan, thank you so much for joining us today on the show, Head of Foreign Exchange Research at ANZ. Also coming up, uh, South Africa's largest business lobby group is calling for the new multi-party government to jumpstart the economy with reforms. Our exclusive conversation next. This is Bloomberg. South Africa is currently failing at the basics. So with the structural reform agenda that has been implemented and bringing in the private sector to participate, you know, in fixing the problems, you are therefore going to fix the trading environment so that it is conducive. Mm -hmm. If the
trading environment is conducive, the business confidence goes up. If the business confidence goes up, investment comes in. If investment comes in, we start growing at the right levels. You know, we grew at about 0.6% in 2023. We're projected to grow at about 0.8% in 2024. We're going to be growing at about 1.2% in 2025. Which is still quite While low it's for low. South Africa. It's low, Jennifer, because the population growth is at 1.6%. You know, so you can see that this has actually been negative growth. You know, so for us to be able to make a dent on unemployment, you need at least to be growing at 3% and higher. So I really hope that with the business, with the fixing of the trading environment because of the structural reform agenda, the business confidence going up, the investment coming in will enable us, you know, to be able to grow at the right levels because there's been minimal foreign direct investment in South Africa. You know, South African economy has underperformed in the last few years. You have seen a shift from South Africa to East Africa, you know, in terms of investment. We have lost our um, a, a, a position of being the gateway to the African continent because of the many own goals that we have scored as a country. So we've now been given this new lease on life, you know, and this new opportunity with the GNU, you know, to get this right. And I'm hopeful that that is precisely what we're going to do. And, and what role, just finally, do you see then some of these bilateral relationships playing. This week, there's the AGOA um, meetings that are happening in Washington, D.C. Of course, we know the review that is potentially happening uh, about South Africa in particular, uh, the relationship with, with the U.S. I mean, it, do those need to stay intact? Do, do, do the bilateral rela relationships need to stay intact and potentially improve? Um, because the U.S. is the second biggest trading partner of this country. Does that play a role in this economic growth story for South Africa? It definitely does. It definitely does. I think one of the areas where we have not gotten things right is our foreign policy. And we're hoping again, you know, that with decisions being liberated from Lutuli House, you know, we are going to see a shift in as far as that is concerned. And Lutuli House, so you're we saying, need is ANC. The ANC headquarters, absolutely. You know, so we definitely need a shift in as far as that is concerned. South Africa can get itself out of this economic rut on our own. We need foreign direct investment. We need the international community to back us up. We need confidence in South Africa by the international community. And we don't have enough domestic savings, you know, to can actually revitalize our economy. Very interesting interview there. That was uh, Busi Sewe Mavuso, the CEO of South Africa's largest business lobby, saying the new government must focus on reviving state-run logistics. She spoke exclusively with Bloomberg's Jennifer Zabazaja, who is in Johannesburg and joins us now. Uh, just listening to that interview, uh, Jen, it, it feels as though she's been somewhat disappointed with how fast the South African economy has grown the last couple of years, but would like to see uh, more being done from the government. So how optimistic did you get the sense she was? Right. I think that's fair to say, Jumana. And I think really uh, the, the messaging that Busi wanted to convey is that this May 29th election is potentially, as she was saying there, a, a new opportunity, potentially a new catalyst for South Africa to really accelerate some of those reforms that were started before. Uh, and a lot of that she, she uh, um, you know, gives credit to the GNU, this coalition government. But, you know, as she was pointing out there, there's still a, a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of these state-owned entities that have really been uh, hobbling any sort of growth in this economy, uh, that the private sector now needs to step in and are stepping in uh, to help support the growth there. Uh, and as far as the public sector goes, she believes that the public sector then uh, just needs to create more of a, a trading environment and implementation, uh, focus on implementation uh, and supporting uh, the private sector uh, in doing this. And she thinks in time, potentially, we will start uh, to see some shifts in terms of economic growth in this economy. And if you just take a look at sort of where uh, this economy is at right now, investors seem to be somewhat convinced. I mean, we're seeing a lot of uh, EMs struggling in terms of bonds. But in South Africa, we're seeing investors leaning in. We're seeing returns uh, on some South African denominated uh, debt uh, actually uh, produce some returns for investors. And so it seems like there is some optimism in the air, especially after this May 29th elections. But we will not know really until we start to see some of these numbers coming 
coming down, in terms of unemployment numbers coming down, uh, in terms of getting things like the ports that are really uh, a lot of the backbone of the export uh, uh, industry here uh, up and running. Uh, and, and she is optimistic, but she does say uh, there is a lot of work that needs to be done, and the public sector needs to step in and support the private sector in doing this, and potentially then we'll see uh, some more FDI coming in and, mm -hmm. and see things really make a turn. Yeah, to your point about investor appetite, there's a story up on the terminal. Uh, South Africa's bonds sizzle in lackluster market for EM <laughs> debt. Uh, South African bonds have returned 9.3% yeah. in dollar terms this year, one of the best performing asset class, to your point over there. Jen, yeah. thank you so much. Always good to chat to you. You can Thanks. find more stories like this looking into where the continent stands now and where it's headed by signing up to our newsletter and podcast, Next Africa, on our website and terminal. And don't miss our monthly show show Africa Amplified that happens uh, well will be happening next Friday all right coming up it's been a hot summer for stocks across the Gulf we'll take a deep dive into the region's market performance next this is Bloomberg Welcome back. Stocks in the Gulf region are rebounding after slumping in the first half of 2024. That's as upbeat earnings reports and cheaper valuations entice buyers. For more, equities reporter Farah al Bahrawi joins us now. Farah, uh, give us more color. How, why are these stocks uh, outperforming some of the global markets? Good morning, Jamana. So a lot like what you said, upbeat earnings have been a much of a driver uh, for this uh, for this period in stocks after slumping in the first half. We've had a lot of beats from banks in the United Arab Emirates, like First Abu Dhabi Bank, Emirates NBD, uh, and even in Saudi Arabia, the Saudi Tadawal's uh, profits had grown and they cited an increase in earning, which uh, in volumes, which is a really interesting one to keep an eye out because uh, those values have definitely picked up. One important thing to note is that Aramco's um, secondary share sale, that was $12.4 billion that needed to be covered in demand, essentially. So investors were saving their cash, and now that that's gone, they're back in the market and they're buying where they see some interesting valuations. We've seen the Gulf uh, stock index pull back from the five-year average in terms of valuations. And so that can provide them more of an interesting point for investors that don't want to pick up those stocks at a more elevated levels that we usually see in the Gulf. There is a premium over there. The question is, will this rally continue? Investors are a little bit mixed on that. They some of them see that markets will be range bound for the foreseeable future, um, especially as we um, navigate the rate story, oil prices, as yeah. well as the fact that regional growth is still an issue yeah. over here. Yeah. Excellent. Farah, thank you so much for the overview. Much of the same issues resonating in this part of the world as we talk about in the rest of the world. Uh, that was Farah Al Bahrawi. And that was our show for the week Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Jumana Versace in Dubai. Stay with us for Daybreak Europe. This is Bloomberg.